What is your contribution to some of the discussions taking place? For example, in the U.S. right now, there is a, a desire to go back to you know pre-Glass-Steagall um, type principles, and you are invested in uh, financial institutions that are broad-based. They they do have a retail uh, you know investment bank and and um, an exposure across you know different types of business lines. Um, can we expect to see? Uh, your fund, um, you know, trying to force institutions to be far more focused. No, that's not uh, that's not a likely course. Uh, what we have done actually in the area is that we have uh, started uh, the Cover Bond Investor Council in Europe to support the Cover Bond markets. Mm -hmm. We actually think uh, that type of funding for the banks, for the long-term funding of the banks, is probably one way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, to somehow package the, the retail housing loans and sell the bonds with that kind of cover. Mm -hmm. So at least on the European financials, uh, that's one area where we're quite quite accurate. Saying it's a logical way mm -hmm. of going into the bond market and creating a super supporting the corporate bond market going forward. And I think also in the US it's an obvious question how is actually the funding going to be there be quite a, because quite a lot of housing there is actually now really with the state guarantee through the Fed and Freddie uh, support the market. Right. Um, do you take positions in, well, in covered bonds you're dealing with the capital of the institution, but what about the asset itself? Um, you know, do you, do you look at the assets that they, you know, that they collateralize and, and throw out into the marketplace? Yes, and I think one of the things in Europe is that we would like to have the same kind of transparency that you saw in the US RMBS market. You can get that kind of data on the underlying pool of loans, that uh, would be a huge uh, advantage. Well, what is your greatest fear about the financial services sector today? I think it's obvious that is the what type of regulations that will come in place, uh, which is uh, probably the, the one factor that's going to uh, affect the profitability the most uh, going forward, and it's still quite uncertain which way it's going to develop. You're also very activist in the U.S. and not being an American fund manager, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of resistance in the U.S. to um, the kind of principles that you, you know, espouse. Um, one of them being the separation between chairman and, and CEOs. Um, how successful do you think you're going to be um, in, um, in, in making a difference to U.S. corporate assets? Well, we don't portray ourselves as an activist investor. Uh, what we do is quite simply go out with some general principles and we say that these are good principles. And the, the one area we're working on in the U.S. is that the one you're pointing at, the split of the role. And we think, you know, fundamentally the role of the chairman and the CEO should be separate because not only do the chairman have the responsibility of recruiting the executive officer, but also having the control and oversight of that administration. And as such, we think it's natural that uh, there is a balance of power, if you like, and therefore that you have that uh, division of that role. Now, that may work out different in different industries, but uh, we have as a general starting point that that should be the sensible solution for all companies going forward. When, when this whole debate on uh, the role of sovereign wealth funds globally um, started to come to the fore, um, Someone somewhere decided that the Norwegian example is, is a, a world-class best practice. Did it surprise you uh, that you were being taken notice of at that time? Well, you know, I think the discussion at that time was uh, you know, built on a few premises. One of them was transparency. And you know, the, the Norwegian society is such that if we want to have support for the Norwegian uh, owner of the fund, then you know, it's only 4.8 million people and it's a fund of uh, now around 480 billion US dollars. And that means it's a hundred thousand dollars a person. If you if you need uh, then of course you need the support of the people, and therefore we have this enormous transparency, which is not made to please the rest of the world. It is uh, just a Norwegian uh, domestic political context. But within Norway, you would, might be criticized for uh, taking a position in the rest of the world, but not necessarily reinvesting your fund within Norway. I, I know there's other funds that are reinvested in Norway. Um, what is your sense of countries that have very strong commodities uh, baseline, you know, industries to, to from which funds like yours, um, you know, get developed? Um, what percentage of that income should be reinvested um, in the domestic economy, and what percentage should be global, uh, and at which point should they be global? What's your thinking on that? Well, the, the construct that we have is that 100% uh, of the revenue from the oil sector goes straight out to international capital markets. So in one sense, we're not using any of the, the income because we call it just a wealth replacement. We have wealth in the ground in the form of oil and we uh, take it up and replace it into wealth in the international market around the world. So we're not allowed to invest in Norway at all. 
What the government, however, have said is that they're allowing themselves to spend a maximum of 4% of the fund in a budget deficit every year. So they make up the budget, so to speak, without the oil revenues, and then afterwards see whether it's a budget deficit that they uh, have to take from the return of the fund. However, this construction is such that what they take out should be less than the real return of the fund, so the fund shouldn't shrink in value over time. Um, so give us a sense of how you, um, you know, how how you're making your fund broad-based and how are you how you're coming to the rest of the world outside of mm. North America and Europe. Well, you know, I think uh, the first uh, important issue for the investor is, of course, how we want to place yourself in asset classes, but maybe as important as how we want to place yourself in terms of regions or currencies. And we structurally been uh, slightly overweight relative to market cap in Asia through the whole first 10 years of the fund, but not to a large extent. But uh, it's been Europe has been the biggest relative overweight, US the relative largest underweight, and then Asia in between there. Um, but with regards to the fixed income side, of course, the currencies you may want to access with a larger portion of the fund, uh, Chinese renminbi or Indian rupee, is not accessible for the foreign investor. Uh, so if it was possible to access that market, of course, uh, we may have invested differently. There's a criticism that you know you don't um, you don't include positive screening as part of your of your investment identification strategy. Uh, what's the rationale for that, and and uh, um, you know what's the argument against that, basically? You mean positive screening in terms of ethical criteria or environmental criteria? Right. Oh, well, that hasn't been on the agenda. There are so there is so uh, the um, eight thousand companies or so that we're investing is thirty companies that's excluded. So it's a relatively you know, short list, and those are basically the companies uh, where the company engaged in activity that the Norwegian government has signed at international conventions that have not taken part in. So first of all, the majority of these companies, 20 of them, is weapon producers who's producing landmines or other type of weapons that uh, the Norwegian government do not want to be associated with. Um, there's a few other companies, but that's very limited. Can we expect you to be more heavyweighted in Asia um, in the next two to three years? I think that is a uh, quite likely possibility, yes. Okay. And what do you like about the Asia Pacific region, and um, you know, and what sort of institutions sort of interest you at this point in time? No, I think it's a, it's a broad consensus view that the region is going to grow faster than other regions. However, the question is how much of that will actually accrue to uh, to shareholders, that, uh, and that's of course quite an open question. So it's not an obvious investment proposition. Final question: Are you an active? participant in um, in the global dialogue taking place on the on the sovereign wealth funds um, um, are you an active uh, participant on, on to the um, Santiago principles for example and how do you how do you uh, view your own fund relative to other sovereign wealth funds you know uh, shaping up in the rest of the world well we have subscribed to the Santiago principle as uh, I think uh, most uh, sovereign wealth funds or the larger ones would you say that you were contributed to the principles or, or was the principles sort of you know set up just mirroring what you already do as a result? well you know it was a combined effort from many sovereign wealth funds uh, in that process okay but how do you how do you measure yourself relative to other sovereign wealth funds or do you do that we don't all? measure ourselves relative to other uh, sovereign wealth funds you know we uh, invest in our uh, way and we do uh, the business Practice no way, and, uh, and we leave it to the others to develop uh, their way. You know, it's. Uh, I think that's a healthy way to operate. So. Thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Great.